yes, the art of balance, the difficult art of balance. For some of us, easy. For other, other of us that have challenging centers of gravity, it is very difficult. Today, we're going to focus on talking about some of the, I think for me, some of the most challenging parts of engineering physics is working with this concept of torque balance and equilibrium. All right, so today, we're going to focus on applying the conditions of rotational and translational equilibrium when trying to solve problems involved in balance. Okay, so here's the three little videos. All right, in this first video, of course, this isn't real. And what's happening here, as the person on top of the Coca-Cola bottle is applying a torque, the Coca-Cola bottle's center of mass is changing. Okay, and then what we're trying to do is he's trying to counterbalance his torque so that the Coca-Cola's bottle torque will work in the opposite direction and sum up to zero, and then you'll get a state of balance. Okay, not a realistic situation. This guy in the middle is obviously struggling a lot to maintain a balance of torque on either side of his center of mass, and he's engaging his core muscles to be able to do that and align his body to do that, so it's a very useful way of strengthening your core muscles in the form of yoga. And then this is always amazing when I see these videos of these people putting bricks on top of their heads in such a way as to balance the torque on either side to keep those hundreds of bricks uh, in place. Okay, you can notice that he's tossing bricks up at exactly the same time to keep everything balanced. The torque on the right-hand side, the clockwise torque, is equal to the counterclockwise torque, uh, which allows him to balance all these bricks on top of his head. All right, okay, so let's talk about the simplest questions on balance, uh, which would be just your classic teeter-totter, your seesaw, uh, your seesaw problems, okay? When we're talking about balance, you're talking about two things. You're talking about translational equilibrium, all right, and you're talking about rotational equi equilibrium. So what does that mean? Well, translational equilibrium, we've been playing around with that for the entire time in mechanics, okay? And that's treating the system as a point mass, okay? And what would happen there is that the force in one direction is equal and opposite to the force in the other direction, which causes the object to stay static, all right? So for translational equilibrium, we can say that the normal force, oh, let's change the color on the pen, okay? Let's say that the normal force acting by that fulcrum, that pivot point fulcrum in the middle, the normal force is equal to the force of gravity plus this guy's force plus that guy's force. Okay, so all the, the weight of that, that wood plank plus the weight of both those girls on the wood plank would be equal to the normal force. If that's the case, the object is not gonna be pushed up above the ground or falling down then we've satisfied translational equilibrium. If we've satisfied transla translational equilibrium, the next part is just to make sure that the, the seesaw isn't gonna move in those directions. And in that case, what we need to have is rotational equilibrium. So the torque on one side from that pivot, so the torque in that direction, has to be equal to the torque in that direction. Now, the way I drew those torques with those arrows is not correct. Torque is a rotational motion. All right, so it more relates to this. So the torque on that side, if this girl is going to be pushing down, she's going to be causing torque in a clockwise fashion, and torque on the other side is going to be counterclockwise. Okay, so if the sum of the torque in the system is equal to zero, then you have rotational equilibrium. So the sum of the sum of the torque in the clockwise minus the sum of the torque in the counterclockwise, sorry for that, is equal to zero. Then we would have rotation in equilibrium and the object is gonna be stable, okay? So if you read in, the, in that diagram over there, okay, the weight of, let's say, girl one, times x. x would be the distance between here and here. I'm just going to erase some of this stuff that might be in the way. Okay, and let's say y is the distance between 
the second girl and the pivot point. So the weight of girl one, I'm going to call this girl one, and this is girl two. The weight of girl one times x is going to be the torque, the counterclockwise torque, okay, minus the weight of girl two times y, which is the distance to that pivot point, should be equal to zero. That would be the main setup that you would have to do in order to figure out uh, problems involved in simple balances. So for example, if, I, if one girl was heavier than the other girl, you would ask, okay, so let's rearrange this equation. If one girl was heavier than the other girl, you would ask things like, okay, where, where would the other girl reposition herself on the balance in order, on the teeter-totter, the seesaw, in order for it to stay balanced? She'd have to move up, slide herself up or slide herself away in order to counterbalance. And we've all experienced that when you sat on a seesaw with somebody that's heavier than you, you either have to lean back or you have to move forward uh, in order to keep the the balance over the center, okay? So I'm not going to solve any of these problems. I'm just talking about uh, the important aspects, okay? So the next type is a little bit more complicated seesaw where our pivot is no longer in the center. So the pivot is not in center. It is not in center, okay? So if the pivot has been moved from the center, and look, I got different weights placed at different positions. This is a bit of a complicated meter rule. Well, you still apply the same principles that we did on top. So you have to look at two things. The translational equilibrium has to be there so that the normal force is equal to all the weight being applied on the system. And the rotational equilibrium, the sum of the torque on the clockwise rotation is equal to the sum of the torque in the counterclockwise around that pivot point. Okay. So if I take a look at that, I can, I can I can, let's take a look at the translational equilibrium. So the Fn minus, uh, let's say, Fg3 plus Fg2 plus Fg1, and also the weight of the ruler, but I'm not going to factor that in right now. Let's just imagine it has, it's weightless, but that ruler would have weight to it. If I subtracted all that, that should be equal to zero, okay? Sometimes it's, a, it's really important that we set this relationship up because a question might be asking, what exactly is the force here? Or, or what exactly is the weight of an object? You, you might need this identity to substitute it into, into the other problems, okay? So that's my translational equilibrium, okay? That equation one. And my rotational equilibrium is going to look like this. So my re re translational equilibrium is going to be look the sum of the torque in the clockwise minus the sum of the torque in the counterclockwise. Okay, so the weight, oops, the weight of 3 times 0 0.3 meters is going to be equal to the weight of 2 times 0 0.4 meters, okay, plus the weight, wow, the weight of 1 times 0 0.7 meters, okay, and that would give me my translational equilibrium, okay, so the force of, I, I wrote this in terms of weight, W, but I should have written Fg, so the mass M3 times G, and that would relate to the equations up top. And then that way I can start substituting equations. If, if they gave me variables in there, for example, I'd be able to solve. So sometimes they would not give you these distances. If they didn't give me these distances, or one of those distances, I would have to use this equation and then substitute it in there to find one of those distances. So if you play around with problems that I've given you as examples, you'll be able to see how you can use one equation to substitute in the other. And we've done that a lot in this course, okay? For example, uh, Kirchhoff's loops and all that stuff. We did lots of substitutions. So the important thing is in these torque balance problems is that you have to use translational equilibrium identities and rotational equilibrium identities and combine them to solve some certain complicated uh, problems, okay? Here's another example of a, of a torque balance problem. So often if you go to the beach, you can see people creating these lopsided balances like this, okay, where my fulcrum is up, offset to the left. The weight of a beam is going to be giving me torque on the other on the right hand side, and then you have to put a little countermass on top to make that balance on the left hand side. Okay, so again, you're going to have translational 
equilibrium, and you're going to have rotational. And you have, to, you have to put those together. So for a translational, this is going to be Fn right over here. And that Fn is balancing the weight of this plus the weight of that. Okay, So Fn minus the weight of the, let's say, the wood beam plus the weight of the mass is equal to zero. That's my translational equilibrium. And then the rotational equilibrium is going to be my, this is my, oops, this is my clockwise, that the weight of the beam is going to be a clockwise torque, okay, and then the weight of the counter mass is going to be my counterclockwise torque, right? So as long as I know my distances from the center of mass, okay, so the weight on the, on the beam is always from the center of its mass, okay, so that would be like the halfway, if, if the beam has a length, of that, okay, the halfway point. The halfway point is where the center of mass is going to be, and that's where the, the that's where the weight is going to be acting. So from that center of mass point to here, that's going to be the distance there. So the torque, the clockwise torque. So the weight times y, okay, is equal to the weight of the mass times x, and then then that's my rotational equilibrium. So they can be asking questions like, what is the mass that you'd have to put there to balance it? Uh, if I shifted my fulcrum to the right, how would everything else have to change? Okay, so it's not that difficult of a problem, but you can take a look at that, okay? And then here, here's a good example for Ikea, okay? If we build a table and we have some supports that we put on the end over here, what would be the force experienced by these supports? Imagine that all of a sudden one of these legs that I put on the edges of these tables, okay, this leg over here, it can only support a certain weight. If I overdo it, that it's going to crush, right? So here's a good example. If I put, if I put that load, like a bunch of books, right in the middle, okay, that weight is going to be equally distributed. But if I shift it over to the left, a good question would be, well, calculate the amount of weight distributed on that leg versus that leg. That's a classic engineering problem, okay? And not too difficult to solve. It's the same principle, okay? What you have to do is do your two equilibria. You have translational, and then you have your rotational. Okay, so for the translational equilibrium, all right, the weight is going to be distributed amongst, so... The force acting up, F1 plus F2, are the forces that are going to be acting up, are going to be counterbalancing the forces that are acting down, which is the weight of 1 plus the weight of the board. The weight of 1 plus the weight of the board. Okay? That's my translational equilibrium. And then my rotational equilibrium, um, I have to start taking a look at where is my pivot? Where, where is my pivot point going to be? Okay, so in, in this case, you, you can decide exactly where your pivot point is going to be. So in a problem, I can say, okay, my pivot point is going to be right on the end over here. Okay, in that case, I can see that I have three different types of torque acting on the system. The force acting at that pivot point will not apply a torque because the distance is zero. So if I place my pivot here, okay, this force cancels out. It's not part of the torque expression. Okay, so let's see, what kind of torque do I have? I have this applying a clockwise torque, I have that applying a clockwise torque, and I have that applying a counterclockwise torque. So then this would say that F2 times the length of the board, okay, is going, is going to be equal to, or sorry, let's just make it minus the weight of the board times L over 2, okay, because that's the center of mass. Center of mass is halfway through the length of the board. So the weight of the board times the length, and length divided by 2, and then plus the weight of mass 1 times whatever that distance is going to be. And all that should be given to you in the problem, okay, except for maybe F2. So in this setup, in this setup, I could solve for F2. If they, did, if they gave me F1, for example, I can solve for F2, 
and then I'd be able to calculate the weight that I put over here. If I had F2 and I had, I could be able to solve for something like this and then I can go back in here and then calculate what F1 is. So the idea is that you're DJing your way through these two equations to be able to answer anything you, they want to ask you. F1, F2, mass, where do I put the mass? Such problems. Okay, that's a, that's a really good problem, classic problem for tables, okay? Here comes, we're starting to get into some heavyweights, okay? Balancing the boom, all right? So this is a good example of something like a hanging sign with a cable, okay, like a for rent sign or something like that. You have a hinge over here, and what's often the case is we don't use the appropriate hinge for the weight of the load that's attached there, and the hinges break. So and oft, often you'll get a question, two types of questions like this, where you'll have a question asking about the forces acting on the hinge or the forces acting on the cable, okay? Will the cable snap or will the hinge break, okay? So in this setup, I got a few hanging weights that are acting there. The cable is applying tension in that direction, so that it has force of tension pulling it in that direction, okay? And that tension or the component of that tension is applying a counter torque to prevent this boom from falling down. So there's a torque, the force of tension is applying a counterclockwise torque to the system while everything else is applying a clockwise torque. So all these bad boys are applying a clockwise torque, whereas my cable is applying the counterclockwise tension. Okay, so let's imagine what kind of problems they can give me. I, they can ask me for the force of tension in the cable, or they can ask me for the force exerted by the wall on the boom in that direction, or they can ask me by, by the force exerted by the hinge in the upward direction. Okay, so first I'd like to figure out what my translational equilibrium is going to be. So translational equilibrium, now you're going to have a, an interesting situation. You're going to have translational in the y direction, and you're also going to have translational in the x component. So you can you be able to create relationships in, in x and y. So for example, if a question was asking me to find this, I definitely would have to set up a translational equilibrium in the x component. And what the root of the problem is to try to solve what ft is. And if I know the angle, okay, I'd be able to use trigonometry to find that component. And that, that component would then become equal to that, equal and opposite to that component. So if they wanted me to calculate the force that the wall is exerting, I would have to get a translational equilibrium for x, okay? If they want me to calculate the force that the hinge is applying in the upward direction, then I need to create a translational equilibrium for y. I still need to calculate the force of tension in the cable, and then I have to use trigonometry to calculate the vertical component of that. Um, or, yeah, kind of. We'll see. Not the vertical component. Um, but but we'll see what, 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 what we'll get there in a second. But yeah, definitely I would have to calculate some component of that. Okay, so let's just take a look at the rotational part first. Okay. All right, so we have to figure out where our pivot point is going to be. And why not, why not make our pivot point, in, in this case, let's make our pivot point here. Okay, so that F applied there is not going to be part of the rotational equilibrium. Okay, so if I knew all these distances, let's call that X. Okay, this is going to be L divided by 2, the length of the boom divided by 2, and let's call this Y. Okay, and then I would definitely need to know uh, certain distances up here. Okay for that, for the dimensions there, okay? I'd have to be able to figure that out and then be able to f be able to work with all that. Okay, so if we're working through the pivot point being at that point, okay, the rotation of the equilibrium, the counterclockwise or the clockwise rotation is gonna be equal to the counterclockwise rotation uh, through that pivot point. So then if I'm looking at the clockwise, we would then have the weight of m2 times x plus the weight of the board times l over 2 plus the weight of mass 1 times y, okay, is going to be equal to the counterclockwise moment, okay? So it's going to be 
I need to calculate that force, that, that, that component of the force uh, of tension times that distance is going to be the, the, the counter at that pivot. Okay, so I'd have to use some trigonometry over there. So this looks like, depends on what, what angle or what information they gave me, if they gave me this angle here, or if they gave me an angle there, I would have to use trig to solve for that component, and then I'd have to know the distance here to be able to get all that, okay? So after setting up a rotational equilibrium, I'm sorry I'm not solving the whole problem, I'm just trying to give you guys a bit of the logic behind solving this problem. You'll have to work it out on your own if you see an, an example of it. Then I would have to play around with my translational equilibria that I've created in the y direction or the x direction to do some interesting substitutions to calculate, for example, the force in the hinge or the force of the walls exerting or the force of tension in that cable, okay? So I'm just going to leave that problem there. Maybe what I'll do in the next episode is I'm going to come back to this with an example problem so we can play around with it and see. But as you can see, it's getting a lot more complicated than the other ones before that, okay? And then the classic leaning ladder problem, okay? What we often like to think about is will the ladder slip? And this is a practical situation when you're actually using a ladder, okay? If I start off here, it's not gonna slip. It only starts to slip as I get further and further away from this pivot point, okay? So often questions that they can ask is what is the force of friction uh, that is that the, the floor is applying in order to keep it stable if a person is over here on the ladder, okay? In order to do this problem, uh, you have to set everything up like this. You need to know some dimensions. I need to know how high the ladder is. I need to know maybe an angle, okay? There, this will all be given to you. I need to maybe know some of these distances here because that'll be important for the torque relationships. Okay, and then I'm just wanted to highlight a few things that I drew down here. That's the force that the wall is applying in the x direction, which is going to be equal and opposite to the force applied by friction. Okay, that's part of a translational equilibrium. So let's write this translational equilibrium. So the translational equilibrium in x direction is going to be fw is equal to ff. Okay, that's, that's for sure. All right. And then the translational equilibrium in the y direction, your Fn is going to be equal to the weight of everything that's being applied onto it. So your F, Fn, the normal force here, is equal to the weight of the person plus the weight of the ladder. Okay, and that would be Fn in that vertical direction. Okay, if you needed to apply that in some creative way. All right, so these are my translate, that's my X translational, that's my Y translational, okay? And you would see when and where you need to apply this, okay? So now for my rotational equilibria, for all these problems, you can decide where the pivot point is gonna be. And I'm just gonna decide that my pivot point is gonna be here. So around that pivot point, I'm gonna take a look at all the forces and figure out wh how, how my, torque in the clockwise direction is balanced with the torque in the counterclockwise direction. So what's supplying torque in the clockwise direction? Okay, the normal force at that point is supplying torque in the clockwise direction. All right, and then in the counterclockwise direction, I would have, uh, yeah, I would have the weight of the ladder and then I would have the weight of the person applying that, okay? And then the wall would, would also be having to apply a force in that direction in order, in order to prevent the ladder from slipping down the wall, okay? So there would be a force in that component in that direction, okay? So if I made, if I made my pivot point over here, Okay, Fn times that pivot point, there's, that's not going to have a component in the rotational uh, equilibrium. Only this component force up here, the force that the wall is applying in an upward direction over there, is going to be countering everything else. Okay, so the force of the wall times that this entire distance, remember it has to be a perp perpendicular distance, 
Okay, so that would be, if I knew this angle and I knew the length of the ladder, that would be this distance z. Let's just call that z. It's that perpendicular distance. The force of the wall times that is going to be equal to, and that's the force of the wall in the y direction, is going to be equal to, all right, fg1 times y plus fg2 times x, okay? And that would be my translational equilibria, or my rotational equilibria. And then in these problems, I would be able to play around with these equilibria to be able to solve, for example, what FF is or what FN is, okay? And in, this, in the way I set up this problem, this, is my, this rotational equilibria is more aligned for solving what the force is uh, on here in the upward direction or the, what my FN is going to be rather than this, okay? So we'd have to take a look at, at how that's going to work. Okay, on, on, on the other hand, on the other hand, this force over here that the wall is pushing, the wall pushing in that direction is also applying a torque. So it's not just the wall pushing up, it can be the wall pushing in that direction, okay, that is applying a torque, all right? So what, what would that torque be? That, that torque would be the force that the wall is applying here times that component of the arm. So I would have to use trigonometry to find that component of the arm. Okay, and then I could substitute that. Instead of doing this, it would be the force in the horizontal direction. Okay, so it would be the force in the horizontal direction. Okay, FW here times whatever my trigonometry would give me here or that, or, or essentially y, the vertical height of the ladder. Okay, yeah, that would definitely give me what I'm looking for. That would be my counter clockwise torque, and then versus everything else. Sorry for the mess in the variables here, but I hope you get the, the general gist of all of this. Okay, so we'll go through this problem, and we'll go through this problem in a little bit more detail if you guys want. But these are the classic challenges. And, and yeah, I made a mistake here by not giving you actual numbers. It'd be nice to go through. And the next time I make a, a little episode here, I'll make sure I have a problem with example numbers.